Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We talked about this morning about uh, reconciliation, what the Father had done for us. Some interesting doors that allows our bodies to be put under the subjection of the Holy Spirit. Uh, for the first time in life, a lost man can be under religious uh, subjection. He can be under uh, a level of uh, subjection to their conscience, a level of subjection just to his surroundings and maybe environment and so forth. But once you're saved for the first time in your life, you have the actual ability uh, by given by God to subdue that flesh and bring it into a yielded nature so that it doesn't fight against who you are in Christ, that spiritual man, the new man in Jesus Christ. And I want to read you something. You've been, you and I have been joined to a body after salvation. And it is a body that consists of all of the saints from Pentecost, or at least uh, however, wherever you want to start the New Testament. I would start there, but wherever you want to start the New Testament, right up to the rapture, this, this inclusive uh, and yet selective body consists of all those people who have been born again and have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the scriptures say this about our situation then. Uh, it says in verse uh, 14, for we, uh, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk, not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds, uh, mind, but having their, uh, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. Uh, if so be ye have heard, heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in, the, uh, in righteousness and true holiness. Let's, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you today for your goodness. We thank you, God, for taking us out of this world, uh, spiritually speaking and one day bodily speaking. But for the time now, you've taken our spirits and joined them to the Lord Jesus Christ. What's left here for the world to observe are, are these bodies and what we do with them. I pray this morning, Lord, that you'd bless the, the preaching of your word, bless the message. Uh, Lord, we've uh, already gone through a lengthy list of uh, prayer needs from uh, bad health to lost family members and uh, churches that are uh, being uh, overwhelmed and swept by this uh, COVID uh, scourge. And from whatever source it comes, God, uh, we must deal with it. Pray that uh, we would have your blessings and your strength to come through it. Now, Lord, please bless all that is said, all that is done. Have your way in our lives. And Lord, help us to keep under our bodies that we be useful and profitable to thee. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 talks about that body yet again. We have two bodies that we address here. One is the body of Christ. That's what we all have uh, belonged to after salvation. The other one is uh, these physical bodies that are, that are around us. And believe it or not, they have great influence over you. Uh, you might think if you get, woke up this morning really tired, 
the first thought in your head might have been, I think I need to roll over and sleep a little longer. And uh, if the spiritual man prevailed, uh, you said, nah, you can take a nap when you come home. You can rest a little bit later. You need to get to church. Just pay attention, see what the Lord will give you. Uh, if the flesh prevailed, uh, well, I don't know why I'm saying that. You're not here to hear. <laughs> so whatever happened there. Uh, but yeah, obviously and uh, clearly, there's a discernible difference. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, we spoke about this briefly, uh, I believe, last week. Paul says, uh, by the inspiration of God and preserved for us to benefit from it. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul says this flesh here, that can either be used for God, and it is not something God's going to get great treasures out of it, but as long as it's not hindering the work, it can certainly be better than if it does. And be not conformed to, the, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given unto me that every man among you, uh, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is uh, given to us, uh, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And he goes on from there. And it goes on down to actual business, just business, not slothful in business. Whatever we do, our outward lives ought to manifest that it's being done under the auspices of a glorious God and Savior uh, among whom we stand as the reconciling factors, uh, the beneficiaries of it, and the, the uh, advertisers of that to a lost world. But when we, the more you think about it, the more you realize that God uses our human body to illustrate the church body. So everybody here has a position, a place, and a purpose. And I suspect the, uh, the uh, messages that have been preached on that are practically limitless, the uh, illustrations, both humorous and serious, uh, probably stretch from horizon to horizon about what part of the body are you. And uh, our estimation of ourself, I suspect, at times changes. But I want to look at some things today that the Bible says about our bodies and how they ought to be used uh, in the service and in the, uh, the uh, walk that we have daily with the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 11, if you would. Hebrews chapter 11. And it describes some things that, that uh, sort of bridge the gap between these, the, the tangible, the intangible, between the spiritual and the physical. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Through faith, uh, for by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, that's, that's kind of interesting things, but it talks about having faith in things you can't see. So when we use the eyes of faith, we have to take these physical eyes. What illustrations do we get from them? And how do we apply that to our faith? Well, if faith is a substance that can be seen and hoped for, there ought to be something in our spiritual life that we realize it's much deeper and much more far-ranging than anything that can be fully realized uh, immediately. Uh, Do you ever notice that if you have different colored glasses on, uh, there's some yellow ones that uh, are recommended for night driving. Everything brightens up. They put sunglasses on the daytime, dims the sun a little bit. They change your perspective on things. I used to have some... Uh, uh, rose-colored ones I used to wear riding my motorcycle. And they were kind of interesting until you got to a red light. And <laughs> it, it, just, uh, it just nullifies that. It just disappears, which I didn't think really meant much anyway at the time. But sometimes our perspective is warped by what we see. 
Sometimes it is uh, disillusioning by what we see, and sometimes it's just changed to an unreality. But the eyes of our faith ought to be something that are focused clearly on what does the Bible say. Truth is all, always believing more than you can see. Uh, I'm sure you've met people that they, they don't believe anything they can't see, and, uh, and yet they go get in their car and they just turn the key and expect it to start. They don't uh, have some kind of little diagram on the dashboard following the electrical current. It leaves the battery through the starter and all the places that it has to go. And they walk in their house in the evening and they flip on a light switch and they, they don't uh, make a phone call on a phone they don't trust to a power plant they don't, they don't believe in to make sure they're making electricity so they're not wasting their time flipping that switch. They just trust that it's going to come on. Lives are filled with faith. We walk out the door in the morning with a confidence, uh, okay, I'll see you later. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. Who knows? But we live by faith. Almost everything in our life is by faith. Every commitment we make is by faith. Every payment we make, every check we receive is by faith. We need to have eyes to see the real things that God offers. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8 and 9 makes some statements about, uh, about our faith that quite frankly, should we ever really take these things to heart, probably would be life-changing for the majority of us. It says uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 8, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, it says, Whom having not seen ye love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. You know something? Everything we just talked about in that ver those two verses there, you haven't seen a bit of it with the eyes of your flesh. And yet the eyes of faith can comprehend those things. Uh, who knows? Maybe 10, 20, 30, 40, uh, if the Lord don't come, maybe an entire lifetime away for some of you. And then the reality is, is what am I going to do with what I've seen? Is it going to change my life? Is it going to get, uh, as I walk in my life, getting closer to the end, going to focus my attention more on the things that are not seen? Or am I going to be distracted by the shiny junk of this world? You know, there, there's far too many people. They make professions of faith, but when you look at their lives, you see they're walking with a dim view towards eternity. They really don't have an excitement in their heart or in their step about serving the Lord. And it's all done with sort of a, a sense of, boy, I hope this is true. You know, when, the, when a Christian talks about hope, it's not a hope of I hope it's true. It's not a wishful euphemism for blind optimism. It's I believe that from the very bottom of my heart. By faith, I've seen that afar off that new heaven, that new earth. I've seen my Savior coming in glory and waiting for him to call me up. And it's a hope that maybe it's going to be today. You don't get on an airplane, well, I hope it flies. You just get on an airplane hoping it's a good flight. Otherwise, you wouldn't get on. Or you'd live the whole time on that plane in fear. Well, listen, I see a lot of people that profess to be Christians, and I think they have that latter kind of uh, faith. They believe something, but they have no confidence in the Savior who's done it. They have no real confidence in anything at all going on uh, of a spiritual life, and they therefore can't invest much of their attention in it. So things of faith become sort of a speculative talk, just sort of an interesting kind of wild-eyed conversation or just a... Yeah, you know, the longing, oh, if only that was true. Well, I'll guarantee you that it is. You remember back in, uh, we, we're not going to turn there just for the sake of time, and I'm, I'm tired. This body is tired. In Genesis 21, there was a, a woman named Hagar, and Abraham had taken, uh, taken God's promises into his own hands to fulfill them. And boy, if there's ever a warning, don't do it wait on God, this ought to be it. The problems that came from Hagar and uh, uh, Abraham's wife and their decisions plague Israel to this very day. And it's a curse to their very children. 
But uh, Abraham is told by God to cast out the bondwoman and her son. And she goes out there and she's uh, laying there uh, as a cast out, wondering what's going to become of me. And the Lord opened her eyes and showed her something. You know, you realize that whatever it was, it wasn't miraculously put there. It just could only be seen when she was willing to wait on the Lord just a little bit. And God shows us things like that. We worry and cast our, our thoughts into every dark corner and every worry and every panic and every crazy thing. I, I'll tell you what, uh, I saw a thing the other day and it says, what, what can you do to put away fear today? Turn off the television. Uh, this is just a fear monger. That's really its purpose. It exists for uh, seemingly no other reason today than to make people fearful of, every, of the things that are coming upon the earth, give you a sense of futility and frustration and panic so that you just are out of your mind with fear. And when somebody says something's going to happen, you run around screaming, yanking your hair out uh, by the gobs that the sky is falling. No, it isn't. That Bible says as long as... Uh, is uh, the earth here, seed time and harvest are going to remain, and Jesus Christ is still going to be your stay. He's still going to be the only hope of the saved. He's still going to be the only one that you have a given ultimate accountability to. What we need to do is say, yeah, it might be a horrible kind of thing. Isn't that just what God said? Thank God we've got a perfect Bible. Thank God we've got a Bible that tells you the truth just like it really is. Doesn't try and sugarcoat bad things. Doesn't try and tone down good things so you don't get too excited about it. and uh, get one of the, Be one of those religious crazy people. God says, you ought to be so excited, you about to jump out of your skin every time the hope of Christ in you rises up. Because you can see afar off that the glory that's coming is in him. Man, our good days, our best days are yet on the horizon. I don't care how well you are today, how rich you are, or, or what your uh, prognostication of the immediate future are. When Christ shows up, that's going to be the best day of your life. It's going to be the best day of every saved man's life except maybe the day you got saved. But even that one, seeing the one who real, uh, realizes all the fulfillment of the hope that you and I have within us, having not seen, we love. You know what that says? The end of that verse, one eight, uh, chapter 1, verse 8 says, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know it's going to be sad? I bet some days, uh, some people in the Christian life, that'll be the first time they ever had a shout. Glory to God! There he is! It's just like the Bible said. Full of glory. Nothing else. No, no looking down, no looking back, no worry, no sense of loss, no sense of anything except being the presence of the everlasting glory of the living God. What a great day. Hagar just got a view, of a little glimmer of God providing for her. Kind of interesting. Balaam's eyes were open to the angel of the Lord with a drawn sword. That's probably a terrifying prospect. How are you going to see the Lord? Scared? Saved? Faithful? Wishy-washy? Part-time? Serving with joy? It's entirely up to you. Say, well, I just don't see things through rose-colored rose glasses like you do. Well, maybe you ought to borrow mine. <laughs> maybe you uh, ought to try some of those on sometime. You know, there's nothing wrong with being optimistic about the Lord. Matter of fact, I don't know what you could possibly be optimistic about beside Him. Well, we've, I've got a lot of cash put aside. You may not have after three years from I go by. Well, I'm, I'm right at the edge of retirement. Praise the Lord. You know what? Creepy Joe and his bunch of perverts and deviates and financial miscreants, communist uh, rabble, they could yank the rug out from under you and I in the blink of an eye. You know the one thing they can't take? The hope of glory that rests in your heart. Man, no matter what happens, it's still in there, isn't it? As a matter of fact, if I can say with a little confidence, the worse things get... Doesn't the Lord look that much better? He says, I'm the Lord, I change not. Amen. Thank God. When I was his enemy, he loved me. When I say, when he saved me, he really became my friend. Think I'm going to be worse off now? Oh, no, 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 no. Everything's going to be good. 
going to be just fine. You know something else? Those people, they looked at uh, previously unseen provision. Balaam didn't realize the Lord's looking out for him even in his wickedness. And Hagar didn't realize in her desperate need of being an outcast, God had provided what she needed for her sons to grow and be one of the princes that Abraham had prayed for. A lot of times you and I just don't have the eyes to see what God's got in store for them that love him. They're, well, all I see is trouble. Well, amen. Isn't that great? The more trouble you have, the more hope and experience it builds in you. That ought to, that ought to make you a real fighter instead of just a, a worn out wimp laying by the side. Oh, it's so bad. It's so hard. They were almost there, folks. Man, I look at 74. How much longer is this going to go on? I'm almost home. I feel sorry in a way for some of our youngsters, but I'm going to tell you what, you've never had a better time to be a better testimony, to be a brighter light, to gain more rewards at the judgment seat of Christ than you have in this next generation. Because almost nobody's serving the Lord. Almost nobody cares two cents about anything. And if you can draw an eye to God and you can have him uh, put his blessing on your life by your faithful walk and service, I guarantee you God's going to have his eyes on you, his hands on you, directing you, leading you, and dragging you if necessary across the finish line with great success. Steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Don't, don't give in for a second. There's provision not yet seen. There's dangers that uh, we haven't even realized yet that God's protected, protected us from. Elisha's servant and uh, Elisha, or, or uh, I've always pictured it kind of hiding behind a wall. And, and the servant's looking around and he's seeing this, the armies out there of the enemy just circling them round and round and round. And he's shaking in his shoes and Elisha's, oh, this is going to be a good day. And the servant says, what are you blind? Well, I'm just paraphrasing. He says, what are you blind? Don't you see the problem we're in? You know what Elisha prayed? He said, Lord, open the eyes of my servant here. Would to God, God would open all of our eyes. Because you know what God showed him? He showed him these chariots of fire circling the enemy, circling around them, keeping them safe, keeping the enemy at a distance. And Elisha simply says, there's a greater army for us than those guys out there. Don't you worry about a thing. But what about this? What about, it? What about nothing? God's not going to give up because you've got problems. When you've got problems, it's a great time for God to come show you something. You know what Elisha's servant saw? When he saw those chariots and horses of fire, he realized that God had given him unseen protection the whole time. All the while, he's worrying and sweating. I mean, don't you think about things like that for a while before you spit it out and let anybody else know what a, what a chicken you are? Yeah, you let that stuff swell up and fester. and Man, it gets percolating under your, uh, your old skin there. And pretty soon, well, look at what a mess it is. God says, just calm your head there, little, little cutie pie. I got you covered. I'll take care of you. We worry ourselves sick over things God says, I've already got that all figured out. Before I even started it, I knew what I was going to do. You know what's sad? I, I don't know if God's ever been surprised at anything. I kind of doubt it. But wouldn't it be amazing if one time we could just surprise him? And he says, uh, well, you weren't at least a bit scared. You weren't worried about that at all. And no, Lord, I knew you'd take care of it. I didn't have any idea how, but I knew you would. That might surprise the Lord. I, I don't know. You know those disciples walking down the Emmaus Road? They're walking down there. And you know how you walk when you're excited and in a hurry? And then you know how you walk when you're going to school, going to work, waiting to have the boss chew you out. Somebody pulls up alongside him and this is a, hey guys, what's going on? Oh, we just coming back from Jerusalem. A bit of bad scene down there, man. You know, we, we, thought, uh, we thought we were home free. We thought Jesus was going to be the one. We thought he was going to take care of all of these things. And here it is the third day. and 
No sight of him. He's gone. You know, that implies they believed something about a resurrection. But not enough. And they walk along there and Jesus don't want to make them understand who he is because you know when you get real excited you don't hear very well. There's some connection to an excited heart and eyes that go blind and ears that don't hear. So he's explaining to them. It says all of the things concerning himself in the law and the prophets and the Psalms. And, and they look around and say, Wow. And then they sit down at dinner and say, Jesus, why don't you come in and have dinner with us uh, there, Mr. Preacher or Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Concordance? Okay. He sat down and said it was made known unto them in the breaking of bread. And their eyes were opened. Boy, I tell you what, when their eyes were opened, and he's been with us all this time. Can you imagine that? We've been worried. We've been fretting. We've been laying out our sob story and... I guess all the Lord knows we paid some attention to the things he told us. But you know what? We never gained the hope that we should have had through those things. We never gained the confidence we should have had to the fact he says, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm here with you now, but I'm going to go away. And it's expedient that I go away, that I come again. We should have just been living in expectation. Peter goes out to preach and, uh, a little bit after that on the porch of the temple a couple months later. And he's still preaching. You know, the Lord's coming back sometime. And he realized he'd already been back once in reassurance. Didn't fully comprehend he was actually dwelling there and opening their eyes daily to the truths of Scripture and the truths of his ever-present reality with them. You know what you find? When your life gets tough and you get that Bible open instead of whining and complaining and griping and grumbling, and you start reading that Bible and taking some of those promises that God says of if I'm saved, he'll never leave me or forsake me. Well, man, I got a friend now. I got somebody that's going with me through all of this. It says in there that, uh, you know, when you're in a church family, they're to edify you and help you. You realize that, man, I have friends God's given me to help me through these things. And all of these, these things there, you realize that God, your Father, is making you just so able and strong through the trust that you're developing. You realize that uh, unknown fellowship is a marvelous thing. When it's finally realized and the eyes of your faith can look around and realize we're no less cared for than Hagar. We're no less uh, uh, in danger than Balaam's donkey was. We have no more problems surrounding us that we're on our own than Elisha and his servant were. And we can have as much fellowship with the Lord as those disciples did. And you know what? More. That Holy Spirit was not yet abiding them. They went away, but not with great joy yet. That joy showed up, but it was when that Spirit moved in and they began listening to the Spirit's call. And they began seeing through things, through spiritual truths and realities. Far too often the Bible becomes to us the same thing it is to lost men. Just sort of a, a wish book or a, oh, that's, that's great, but, but what about now? Listen, you, you have eternal life, don't you? That's now. That's always now. There's not waiting for eternal life. We're enjoying that now. These things were there in each case but they lacked the vision that real faith could provide. And only faith could provide comfort through what they'd seen. Look over in John chapter 5. And John chapter 5 is another sort of attribute that sometimes we uh, are very, very deficient in. I find out my hearing is horrible. If... if uh, if we're ever standing around here and you talk to me uh, and I look like I don't know what you're talking about, that very well could be the case because if there's a lot of noise going on, I may not even, well, I can hear noise, but I may not uh, hear what you're saying. Usually I'll uh, kind of lean over and say, say that a little bit louder. I say, well, that's annoying to me. It's annoying to me not hearing you, but <laughs> I guess I could survive if you could. 
uh, but it's just a, it's just one of those realities. People tell me their names. I have the unique ability to forget something almost before I've even heard it. And I, I'm not saying that in any way other than that, that's a very pathetic kind of thing. But people, seriously, they can tell me their name. Once I've read it, I'm pretty good. But if I just hear it, it, it just doesn't sink in. But look at this. John chapter 5, verse, uh, let me see here. Where do I want to start? Uh, verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me. Now that's interesting. you got to not only hear the word, but it's got to be more than just a sound. It has to be something with clarity. It has to be something with definitive uh, notions to it so that you can make some absolute conclusions about what you've heard. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and is not passed into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. Well, man, that's, that's going to be... Uh, that's going to be notable. Dead people can hear God when a lot of living people don't. Must be something by faith that we do. The Bible says in John 8, 47, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees there, and he says, listen, you're hearing some sound because we're having a discussion here, but you're not hearing the words that I'm speaking. And that's, uh, I think, probably what you find with most of the people that you talk with. I can remember over the years, you talk to somebody and they, they say, well, well, how do you know you're saved? Well, the Bible says if you believe on Jesus Christ, you can have everlasting life and God washes away your sins and gives you everlasting life and the Holy Spirit in your heart. Well, you just think you're better than me. How did you get that out of what I just told you? I didn't say anything at all about me other than something somebody had done for me, something I'd received. Let me try it another way. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But when a man gets saved, he has eternal life. I have eternal life. Well, you just think you're, you're much better than me. No. All have sinned. I'm, I'm part of that all. But I'm also part of a minority that has heard the call of God to those that are sinners but don't want to be and want to step out of those ranks into the ranks of the saved. And he held out a gift of eternal life and freedom from sin. And I accepted it. Well, you just, you just want me to join your church. See, people don't hear what you say. It, it takes a lot of effort and, uh, and willingness for us to be patient to get through any kind of message that will ever have a real relevance to people. Most people think, well, I'll get saved at, at a church that preaches the Bible, but I want to go back to my old church. Why? Though they were content to put you in a lake of fire, you fool. Well, uh, friends, well, let me give you just an encouraging word of advice from the scriptures. Go to your family while you still can. Go to your friends, if in fact you're their friend, and tell them flee from the wrath to come. Find out how to get saved and then get away from the things that don't profit for the day in the day of wrath. Oh, but they won't listen. Well, you know your friends better than I do. But then that's the truth. Oh, I just I like to be around people that like me. Well, why don't you try something different? Maybe other people would like you that are saved. It's, it's a strange world we live in, folks. People have ears, but they don't hear. Jesus warned them about that. It's like preaching to a, a field of corn. Ears everywhere, but nothing's listening. <laughs> in John chapter 12, look with me over in John chapter 12. I'm going to finish this message tonight, by the way. The Lord willing. John chapter 12, verse 27. Jesus says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. 
Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by heard it and said that it thundered. That's interesting. And others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Isn't that kind of wild? Everybody hears things in a different kind of way. I have some people that talk to me, and I, I, I feel pretty comfortable using myself as a, as a uh, lame example. And uh, especially uh, women and little kids, they have a voice that's a certain pitch. And it's almost like it just kind of, and then it just disappears. And I watch what their lips are moving. With little kids, you can't hardly tell. Sometimes with older people, you can't hardly tell. Sometimes even when I hear it, I can hardly <laughs> You, you understand what I'm saying. This world doesn't hear God at all. Or if it does, it muddles the message of, I love you, when God's saying, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. When the, when the Lord spoke to Paul on the Damascus Road, you realize that God spoke to Paul. Other people heard the sound, but they didn't discern a voice in it. I think that's the way God deals with things. Somebody says, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go uh, doing this, and, and, and uh, didn't God tell you to go with me? Maybe not. If he's talking to you, maybe you should just do what God told you to do. A lot of times we expect other people to hear the same thing from God that we do. Now listen, I'm not talking about the gospel or doctrinal matters. I'm talking about daily living. And I'll be honest with you, I see people sometimes, they, they have a life, they do things, and I look at it and say, man, God would never let me do that. I, I talked to a lady down a mystic uh, yesterday, and she walked, her and her husband, I, I presume it was her husband, walked by and uh, stopped about 10 feet from us, and she come walking back. And in a, in a kind of a sheepish voice, she said, I, I really appreciate you. You guys doing this. Okay. I said, well, I, I said, I, I just appreciate being able to do what God told us to do. And she looked at me kind of funny. She says, I, I'd be too scared or wouldn't have enough nerve. I forget how she phrased it, but I, I don't do that. And I said, you know, everybody's got a different call. I said, but quite frankly, Jesus told us to go into all the world, preach the gospel. He didn't put my name on that. He just said, you, go. I said, I'd be more terrified not to than I would to j just know that I should and don't. And I, the look on her face, <sighs> you know what people don't realize? Think about this for a minute. If you were a Jew in Babylon, and at the sound of the trumpet and the sack, uh, the sack butt and the dulcimer and all kinds of music, you were commanded to bow down, and you just basically moved to the back of the room and out, out the door, so you didn't have to be involved in that. And you saw later on these uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego taking prisoners, and the soldiers dragging them up to the front front of the placed by that big fire that was heated seven times hotter and throw those guys in. And you hear them later on, they're probably in there singing and carrying on and just having a good old time in there. You wouldn't have a story to tell like they did, would you? You know what? I, I think heaven's going to be a really interesting place. When we get to sit around in those mansions with our feet up, just kind of maybe taking a Preacher, you really think we're going to, I don't know. What are you going to do? Tell stories about working extra jobs? What are you going to do? Tell stories about all the stuff that you did on vacation? You think that's going to carry any weight? Think anybody there is going to have a flicker of interest in all those things? You know what you're going to have up there that's going to interest people? Listen to Paul. Yeah, and I went to that place and preached. I thought, man, a... They're going to want to hear this. This is from God. I know it is. And then they threw rocks at me till I was dead. 
And they carried me out and threw me in a pile there. And I got up and dusted myself off. And I went on to another place. And I said, wow, that's pretty exciting. And then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I said, man, you know, we saw that fire there. And we just decided we're not, we're not going to bend. We're not going to bow. And, and if we burn, we burn. But uh, we're going to follow the Lord. And when, God, when, the, when the Lord allowed them to throw us in there, and there's, we didn't know who he was right that second, but we found that was Jesus in there. He said, let me tell you about what our fellowship was while we were in that fire. That's a story yet to be told. You got ears to hear that kind of stuff. What kind of story are you going to tell in heaven? I went to church. <laughs> Man, you got to have a, you got to have a fight story. You got to at least have a story about getting beat with something. You got to have some kind of a story of victory. I mean, God does give you victory over something, doesn't it? No challenge, you know, no, no strain, no glory, no fight, no victory. I, I copied a thing again. I, I should have brought it to the pulpit to read it. It was uh, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, part of a speech that he gave about the man in the arena. And it just, it just uh, makes a hair on my neck stand up every time I read it. And the gist of the story is, it's not the critic or the people that stands on the sidelines and tells the, tells the, 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 uh, the contender how he should have done it or how he should have fought a better fight or so forth. Then it goes down to the end. He says, but it's the one that was in the ring fighting and contending. He's at least said, I didn't lay down with lazy men. I didn't live fearful life. I fought to the end. There's something to be noted about putting up a fight against just the things of this world and just the complacency that is so prevalent in this world. In, uh, in that same chapter, Jesus said in verse 30, let me read that again. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world, and now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. You know, when the Lord draws you, you you've got to realize what you're being drawn for. That Bible says, all of they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, it may not be burning at the stake. Thank God for that. It may not be being pilloried and putting the stocks for the whole town to, to, to laugh at and make fun of. It may not be, you know, loss of job or deprived of privilege or something. But there's going to be some things that if you're going to live godly for Christ Jesus, you're going to have to realize it's going to cost you somewhere. It's going to cost you something. You know what? We ought to accept that price. Glad to pay it. It was a small price for the blessings that came along with it. Small price for what the Lord's done for me. Glad to be counted to be in that small group of people who are willing to suffer and fight for the Lord Jesus Christ's glory. Now look down here in verse 37 of that same, uh, uh, same, same chapter. But though, though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. You know, they, I used to say seeing is believing. No, it didn't. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which spake, uh, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. Wow, that's, that's pretty revealing. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, many, many also many believed on him. Uh, also, because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. When we worry about what is this world going to take from me, if I speak openly of a, of a Savior, openly of, of a, uh, the God manifest in the flesh, 
we've already shown a significant level of fear. And the only way to deal with that is just, man, take a deep breath, tighten your belt up a notch, and say, you know what? Though the, though the devil slay me, yet will I fear him. Yet though uh, the world has its way with me, I'm still going to follow Jesus. If the whole world forsakes me, thank God he loved me enough to save me. I'm going to be with the one that gave his life as a ransom for my soul. The world will hear that. It may sound like folly to them, may sound foolish to them. You know you're going to have the last laugh, don't you? The Bible says, he that sitteth in heaven shall laugh, for he shall have them in derision. God says all the, all the thoughts of the, of the heathen, they're folly, just foolishness. All their grand designs, all their great palaces, all of their empires, God says, listen, they're all coming down. What it's going to do is make way for the kingdom for my dear son. You and I have the privilege of serving him now and letting the world know we don't really care what this world thinks. I'm not looking to be a martyr. I'm not looking to make people mad. I'm not looking to hurt anybody with anything. But if the truth hurts, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Better to be wounded now than burned forever later on. These people had no idea of Jesus' sacrifice. They argued about what profit they could get and what happened. They couldn't see a faith that, or a miracle that God has done and just even hearing God speak to them. All it was to them is just religion and a show. I think that's sadly the way most Christians and professing Christians at least think today. It really doesn't matter. Just go to the church of your choice. Be happy and, you know, do the best you can. I, I'm all for doing the best you can. Anybody here ever said, well, that's the best I could do. And you know, you're lying through your teeth. Could have done a whole lot better than that. Yeah. Usually what that is, is that's when you hear that, that's the accommodation uh, factor of I did all I felt like doing. We ought to try and be more honest with ourselves. We'd be much better off with God. People, uh, you hear them all, see them all the time. They're curious. Sell them to the have ears to hear. Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God sent those prophets to Israel. It says rising be times preaching to them. So well they're not listening. Jeremiah says well at least I know there's been a prophet among them. Isaiah says Lord I've, I've done this all day long. It says they don't even have ears to hear anymore. God says you've done what you could do. You've been faithful. It's on them. Israel was broken off because they would not hear. Thank God you and I have been grafted in because we did. One more verse. Look at Jer uh, uh, James chapter 1. The preacher, I come to church, I listen for the Bible. Amen. Amen. I had a, was uh, building a house one time, the one I live in now, actually. And I'd hired a guy to do some of the, the framing work for me and some other parts of the house. And uh, in our conversation, as, as you might guess, it turned around to salvation and a witness to this fellow. Real nice guy, very, very uh, good businessman, honest, uh, pretty much uh, guy, as far as I could tell. And it got down to salvation, and his answer to me was, well, I'm keeping the law. I said, are you? Yep, keeping the law. I said, I, I doubt that. Oh, no, I am. I said, are you Catholic? He said, yeah. I said, tell me what the law is. Uh, thou shalt not kill. I said, isn't it interesting that that's almost the first one everybody thinks of? You know what that tells me? That's pretty big on your mind. <laughs> that wasn't the last thing you had to struggle to find. That was the first thing that popped into your head. As much as I liked, I'm not going to kill anybody. Anyway, he, he went on, gave me three or four of them, I guess. And 
Finally, I could see he's struggling with them, and I, I gave him a couple of little suggestions. Oh, yeah, yeah. How am I doing? I said, well, I think you got seven. And I didn't help him anymore. I said, how are you going to keep the law? You don't even know what it is. I said, you know what? If we sat here all day and all night too, the first commandment is that you should love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and him only should thou worship and serve. And he got a little bit uh, flustered at that point. I said, are you going to try and tell me you could remember not to kill people, but you didn't remember God in the commandments that's the first one? Well, and you know, the, the sad thing is he heard what I said. You know what he did with it? Nothing. Not a thing. I'd like to say, man, that guy wanted to get saved right then because he realized what is. No. You know what he was? He was one of these people. James chapter 1, verse 22. It says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer, any, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholds himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth there therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You know, it's easy to hear the Bible preached. It's easy to read the Bible. And, you know, you see it, but I'll use the expression, hear it come in. Not quite so easy as actually doing what it says. I'm not talking about lordship, salvation, where if you don't do it, you're not saved. I'm talking about, aren't we really looking for the Lord's blessing? I mean, I, people don't come to our church just to be entertained. They, they wouldn't last through the song service. But I'm hoping they come here to hear the truth. I'm hoping they come here to be encouraged and strengthened, rebuked if necessary, edified all the time, I hope, and become profitable to the Lord. You know what? That's where all the blessings are. That's really where the promises lie. You know what? That's when your ears are perked up and your eyes are open to the sweet fellowship and to the blessings of obedient life. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. These ears might not work so well, but do you have ears of faith? Constantly listening for the Lord's voice. You remember little Samuel? He was given by his mother to, to, the, to the Eli, the old priest. And he went and uh, served Eli faithfully. And Samuel laid down at night and he hears this voice. And he comes running to Eli. Eli said, it wasn't me. He goes back and lays down. A little bit later on, he hears that voice again. He goes back and it wasn't me. You know what uh, Samuel grew up to be? He says, I knew the Lord by the, wor by the word of the Lord. He heard and applied everything that he had to his life. Kind of interesting. Not much in the way of rebuke against Samuel in the Bible. Rare for a priest in those days. Rare for a prophet in those days. That's the kind of servants we ought to be to the Lord. Always listening for the master's call. Not just when he says, Jim or Val, Herb, Dom. Anybody remember David in the battle? He simply said, I, I'm thirsty. So I, want, I wish I had a drink of water from my family well. And his mighty men said, that sounds like an order to me. They break through the lines, fight their way down there, take water out of that well, run it back with a cup of water and a sword. What a picture. They give it to David, and David looks at that thing. I bet he had a lump in his throat that uh, a camel wouldn't replace. And he poured that water out. He says, his, his soldiers, I, I thought you were thirsty. Anybody remember what he said? He said it was, he did that as a sacrifice to those men that, that poured out their lives 
as a sacrifice for him. If David could do that, imagine what our Lord could do if we would just pour out our lives as a sacrifice to him. Let's stand. Uh, let's see here.